Good morning and welcome. We have been anticipating this day for about a year. My name is Betsy Myers. I'm the executive director for the Center for Public Leadership. How lucky are we to be celebrating Warren Bennis? I think one of the most favorite parts of my job has been getting to know Warren. And I, I now consider him my mentor and my friend and one of my favorite people. And through this whole planning of this event for both the day and the evening, Warren and I talked many times on the phone, sometimes several times a day. And as each one of you would call to say you were coming to the event or you joined the tribute committee, we would talk on the phone. And then I would get a story about each of you. So I feel like I know everyone in this room, and it's been a privilege to hear your relationships with Warren. And those of you in the room who don't know Warren as well, you know of him and the work that he's done. When I had many conversations with a variety of you and many of the tribute committee members who said, Betsy, you know what? We don't like conferences anymore. I've gone to a million of them. I don't like to go to them. And we promised a very different kind of day. And you can see from the room that it's a different, different kind of day, a special day to celebrate Warren. We have many partnerships in this room, many of you included, and wanted to just thank US News and World Report for being our partner on this day. And many others of you in the room, our tribute committee and others who help sponsor this day. What does this day represent for us? Well, first is a celebration of Warren his accomplishments in his life. And as we're building the center, people always say, what has Warren Bennis brought to the field of leadership? Credibility. We are trying to make the, the field of leadership a credible academic discipline, but also get our teachings out into the world and with our students. When we were doing this event, um, Warren would come in periodically to Boston, and we'd be doing the materials. And we, for a while, we were going down the track of the Warren Bennis legacy. And one afternoon he said, you know what, I don't like that legacy word. He said, it's my unfinished legacy. And uh, which is what we're really celebrating today at this conference, is Warren's unfinished legacy and his partnership with our center. We are so lucky to be in partnership with Warren as he has just chosen our center to house his works, his thinking, but his continued thinking. And that's what today is about. And all of the panels and the discussion that we're going to be have is about him honoring our center and us trying to build, take our center to the next level. We want to build upon the future. This, our, our um, signs, growing leaders in a changing world. That is what our center is trying to do. The goals of our center is how do we build our, how do we take our students and give them the skills to be the leaders out in the world? Richard Hackman, who's here, um, who's a very well-known academic at Harvard and expert on teams, has been one of the people that's been challenging us to say, if you want to be the cutting-edge center around leadership development, what does that mean? How are you going to do that? We can't do it alone. We can't do it with just scholars at Harvard. We need to reach down deep into the community. And so it's such a, such an, a privilege to have all of these thought leaders here, uh, many of the, the various people on the tribute committee, Spencer Johnson, Tom Peters, Stephen Covey, whose books we've all read over the years. So to bring not only the scholarly thinking to this day, but the, the, the thought leaders and then the incredible business leaders here like Steve Belkin and Howard Schultz and others who will bring us their thoughts. What does it mean to grow leaders and how can we do the best job possible? Our students, are the, we have the most global graduate school at Harvard. They come from 70, 80 different countries every year, and they come here because they want to be better leaders. And I've told the story before, but when David Gergen asked me to take this job, I went to hear the, the new mid-career students talking about, they introduced themselves for 15 seconds. And one of the students stood up and said, I'm from Cameroon, Africa. I come to the Kennedy School as a citizen of the world. I want to leave as a leader of the world. And that is the huge mission for us. And our center is, what is the value add that we contribute to these students? Because academic curriculum is important, but it's not enough. It's like saying to somebody, I learned to swim by reading a book, and I got in the pool and I drowned. 
And so that's what we're trying to do is what is it that we can offer students to expand beyond the curriculum into the skill building. Um, and, and the other thing that we're moving into is that, and, and Warren has been so helpful on this, is that it's about the integrated person. The integrated person that has self-knowledge. And not just because you have an Ivy League degree does not mean that you have the integrated self-understanding of yourself. And so that's really what we're trying to do. And these panels today are going to help facilitate some new thinking from all of you in the audience. This is going to be a dialogue day, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a minute. Um, this center was started six years ago. And you're going to all meet the we Les and Abigail Wexner, who have been our main funders. Um, and it, it came from an idea of a man by the name of Ron Heifetz. And Ron uh, was the co-founder founder of the center with David Gergen. And Ron is known for his, he, he's known as the pioneer, really, at Harvard. 22 years ago, Ron, he came and started the first class on teaching leadership in a different way. Before I took this job, I was a director of alumni and external relations, and I talked to many, many uh, alums all over the world who, looking back at their time at the Kennedy School, whether it was two years, five years, ten years, Ron's class was the class, one of the classes that had the most impact on them. So he's been a real thought leader, an author. He's written two books, uh, Leadership Without Easy Answers and Leadership on the Line. Students, whether you take his class or not take his class, people are talking about his class. And so Ron, as a, as a member of our team at CPL and founder, um, is going to bring him up to stage to say a few words. Um, Ron, it's a pleasure to know you, and thank you. Uh, thank you, Betsy, and thank you for uh, taking our center to the to the next uh, next place. You're doing such a beautiful job with so much heart and wisdom. And thank you, David. Where's David? Thank you, David, for uh, for joining me many years ago uh, when we were both lone rangers in a way and uh, taking the baton and carrying it to places where I never could have taken it with wisdom and with deft leadership capacity. Nobody starts anything alone. And Warren wrote years ago, in fact, it sat in his uh, office for many years before he finally published it, a book on co-leaders. But really, it's a book on how nobody does anything alone. We all stand on people's shoulders. And today is really a day for us to honor history. Many of us talk about change. And we focus on change, and we focus on the future. We even use words like transformation, which tend to connote radical discontinuities into the future. But in fact, most robust adaptive change builds on history. It takes the best from the past and finds a way to carry it into the future. God and evolution didn't do zero-based budgeting. 98% of our DNA is the same as a chimpanzee. 50% is the same as a yeast because the accumulated wisdom of billions of years needs to be preserved. And we're here today to celebrate the extraordinary wisdom of Warren Bennis and how it provides for each of us shoulders and heart and stomach and skill and sinew to build from as we continue to build into the future a generation of leaders who can help communities and organizations around the world find the way to thrive. Thrive in a way that holds on to the best of their cultures, not simply eradicates their cultures and imposes some foreign culture, some foreign image of progress, but an adaptability that honors history and honors that wisdom. Warren's first book was a book called The Planning for Change. Planning for Change. It's a wonderful, almost a paradoxical statement because there's so much change that's unpredictable. And the notion of planning for change was then further developed, that was in 1961 and 1964, in a prescient article on democracy, in which he predicted how democracy would eventually succeed, not because of power or might, but because of its inherent, to use his words, its inherent adaptability, its capacity to draw on the collective intelligence, the diversified intelligence of large numbers of people to run large numbers of experiments, which is how adaptation also takes place 
in nature. So we're here today to draw on his wisdom. And I draw on his wisdom every day. I want to just draw one lesson from his wisdom. It's not in the content. It's his mode of operating. Warren interrogates his own experience. He learns every day from his own experience. He draws on help all the time from people. Whomever he can find, friends, counselors, therapists, he's not shy, he's not too proud to keep learning from his own mistakes, his own successes, and mining that, those veins, that richness for wisdom, uh, for lessons, for applicability. And I think if each of us could honor our own histories today, could spend the day in the same process that we honor Warren, to honor the lessons of all of our own mentors, of all of the people on whose shoulders we stand, our parents, our grandparents, the cultures we come from, on whose shoulders we're trying to build a future that's not a radically discontinuous, discontinuous future, but a future that grows naturally and in an evolutionary sense sustainably. Uh, upon the wisdom of our ancestors and elders. In that sense then, it will always be an unfinished legacy. Because as we build on Warren's shoulders, others will build on ours. May we have a blessed and fruitful and enriching and inspiring day. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Ron. I think the most important thing Ron said, or one of the most important things he said, is that it's about partnerships. And that's why you're all here today. We can't do this alone. We can't build this center alone. We can't figure out what cutting edge leadership development is by ourselves. So as I promised, this is a different kind of conference. You in the audience are, the room is the stage. And we, because we had too many people, we really, had originally thought we put the stage really in the middle, but we couldn't really make that work. So we thought we'd try to have it a different format so you didn't feel like you were in theater style. So you have the rounds. And what we're going to be doing, we're having three panels today, and we're going to have guests on stage. And just as important, we're having expert responders, and the audience is just as important. So the moderators have a very, very important job. Because unlike most conferences where panelists each make their remarks, we're doing this different where the, panel, the moderator will talk to the panelist, go out to a responder, go out to the audience. So it is so important that everyone in this room is able to contribute. Your, every one of your opinions and thoughts and ideas and experiences are so important for us. Because at the end of this conference, we want to take all of this knowledge and put it into to use. This is a living, what we're calling this is our living lab. So you are our living lab today. And in the three conversations, starting with crucibles, and then moving how crucibles impact leadership, and these are all topics that we're wrestling with in our center, and that Warren has done tremendous amount of work on. So it's taking his thoughts, and every panel will be opened with a few minutes from Warren on video. And David and Gergen and I went out and had the, the privilege to spend a day with Warren talking about all of these leadership topics and ideas, and we captured in a couple minutes before every panel his thoughts, and then we'll kick it off to the audience. Each of these areas, so crucibles, and then we'll move to uh, how emotions impact decision making and leadership, and the third, leadership development, how do we go about it, are all areas we're wrestling with. So we look to each of you for, for your input, and that's what we hope to, get to, to gather today. So again, thank you so much for being here. I hope you enjoy every minute uh, of this day as we've enjoyed putting it together and, and thinking through how to make this day as different and special and useful. I'm now going to ask David Gergen to come up. David Gergen, who's the director of our Center for Public Leadership, you all know uh, David, he's, he's, I, we call him, although I'm not sure he loves when I say this, but I think it's a, a compliment. He's the senior statesman out there in the journalist world, journalism world, because he's able to bring both viewpoints, both Republican and Democrat, in a world that is so divisive right now in politics. So people love seeing him on media. And whenever we say, where's our boss? Someone says, he's on the TV, just turn it on. Um, and uh, David is the director of our Center for Public Leadership, has been working on this leadership development question for six years. He's on the faculty here at the Kennedy School. His classes are sold out. 
no surprise, with unbelievable waiting, people waiting to get in his classes. For me, it's been a privilege to be his partner on developing this center and growing this center. And people always say, what's it like to work for David Gergen? And um, the thing about David is he really, he treats people with such compassion um, and he's so, he creates an atmosphere in our center where people can challenge, ask questions and give new ideas. So to my boss and friend, David Gergen. Isn't she wonderful? Isn't she wonderful? <laughs> she, uh, I, I was told by Maris, who, who did such a great job, this was a time to take the tie off. This is supposed to be very informal, uh, with just a conversation. Uh, and I must say, uh, somebody started early last night. Some of you came out of our home last night uh, and took off a jacket. If this is your jacket, we have it. <laughs> we do not know what else you took off. We're still looking around. <laughs> But our dog may have eaten it. We're not sure. But the jacket is still intact. So, uh, so please, and I, I must tell you, coming to a day like this, and I have been enormously moved over these last weeks in preparation for this by how many lives Warren has touched uh, and how many of you consider him such a friend. Uh, we wouldn't be here in this gathering were it not for that sense of friendship in a sense, all of us have that Warren has touched our lives. Uh, that he that one of the, one of the things he does best, in my judgment, and working with so many of you who have been leaders in the business community, working with many of you in the academic community, uh, is that he draws out the best in people. His great specialty is drawing out the best in people, and then making them, allowing them to be all they might be. And I think coming here today, and uh, we actually started these festivities a couple of nights ago. Spencer Johnson came in and talked to our students. It was mesmerizing. Warren was there for the celebration. And yesterday, uh, we had a gathering, too, for a U.S. News Partnership project where we're trying to uh, identify and select best leaders. And, uh, and, and we just had an opportunity to talk during of the day and looking around the room and then last night when we knew we had to Sid Harmon and Howard and David Shaw and so many others, Steve Belkin and so many others were there. Uh, and we also have uh, scholars from all over Harvard, that, which is very unusual. This is a, as you know, with the every tub on the own bottom theory uh, often leaves the ships quite separated and we don't all, we don't all flow as a, a flotilla. Uh, but we've been very proud that people from the business school, people from the School of Education, people from the School of Public Health, uh, from the law school, from the yard, uh, all over Harvard have come here to celebrate Warren, to join in these reflections, and that indeed we have scholars from uh, all over the country, uh, from Yale, from Stanford, from Chicago, uh, from Dartmouth, University of Southern California, uh, and, and others. I, it, 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 we just... There are so many who are becoming, there will be more coming and arriving during the day. Um, uh, we have people here who I think, I haven't quite figured this out yet, but I think collectively among the people who are here, the, the authors who are here, I think collectively they have sold well over 60 million books. Well over 60 million books. I'll have to figure that out. But we have the four horsemen, uh, so as they sometimes uh, are called, of, of Ken Blanchard, uh, Stephen Covey, Spencer Johnson, and Tom Peters, um, who are all very popular authors. Uh, they have only been together on one other occasion, and that was to celebrate, have the West Coast celebration of Warren Bennis on his 75th birthday, and now they've come back uh, six years later for the East Coast celebration. Um, and so we're, we're delighted just to have all of you here. There's so many, uh, I, and, and we'll have a chance during the day, and you'll have a chance to meet Joe, Joe Nye during the day, who really built this place uh, as a former dean and the desorts who are here. Just to, I, I hope we can, everyone can join in the conversation because it's impossible to recognize everybody from the floor. But this is, this is first and foremost a celebration of Warren Bennis. First and foremost, a celebration of Warren Bennis. That's what brought us all here. In Warren's spirit, this is also a day for reflection about leadership. Some of the questions that he has posed in his writings, in his 27 books, now working on the 28th on judgment. Those are the questions that we want to put before us today. 
in the spirit of something that Warren asked in an earlier book. And he said, how can it be that when America was uh, in, in its beginnings at the time of the revolution, when we had three million citizens in this country, how could it be that a society that had only three million people could bring forth such a galaxy of leaders like Washington and Adams and Abigail Adams and, and Hamilton and Jefferson and Franklin and you can go down that list. How could it be that a society of three million could bring forth such a galaxy of leaders and yet today with a society of nearly 300 million we struggle to find a single public leader uh, of that quality. That is an issue that I think hangs over us uh, and is, is, is sort of in the back of our minds as we go through this day. I would also suggest to you that hanging over us as another proposition, only a few months ago, <clears throat> the country was stuck, struck by a storm that was large, that everyone had anticipated. We knew that such a storm would one day hit the Gulf Coast and hit New Orleans, and yet we were totally un uh, unprepared for it. Max Bazerman has written a book about predictable surprises uh, over at the business school, which it should be required reading for everyone. How is, it, how is it we were so unprepared for that gathering storm? I must tell you, as someone who's been in the public arena today, I cannot remember a time in the public arena in America <clears throat> when we have so many gathering storms of such enormous magnitude that are approaching us rapidly as a people and yet the quality of our leadership, our public leadership to respond to it seems to be so emo it seems to be so inadequate to the task. Whether and it's not this is not a partisan statement. This, this is not about one particular administration. It is about our political elite, our public elite, and how they're responding. And it seems to me the whether and it, we don't need to go through the litany of whether it's climate change or the, the imbalances in our finances or our medical care system, whether the retirement, the coming retirement of the baby boom generation, how unprepared we are for that, but, or our ed educational system, or very importantly, the competitive threat that so many of you in this room face in business today from uh, overseas and what that may do to the standard of living in this country if we're not better prepared than we are. So many of those threats are out there and we're not preparing well for them. And it really speaks to the quality of our public leadership. And our, our mission here, what, is, this is not about Warren or about the center only. This is about how we as a people govern ourselves. And what can we do with the kind of talent in this room to think about how we can do this better. How we can prepare the next generation of leaders better than we have. So these are, this, this is a festivity, it's a celebration, but there's also something serious about this. And I don't think we could, I don't think Warren Bennis would ever want to come to anything which didn't advance our understanding and our sense of collective purpose. So that's, that's the spirit in which we gather. Warren, we thank you, we honor you. We so much appreciate the fact that you could bring so many friends together, we could have this day and this evening together. So we'll start now with a panel. We'll turn this over to Ruth Wagaman, who's here. She's a, a visiting uh, from the faculty at Tuck at Tar Dartmouth. She's been a wonderful presence in our midst here, uh, working with students and scholars alike. Um, and she's going to lead this first panel discussion. But again, thank you. We're delighted to see you. <clears throat> And don't forget the coat. Thank you, David. So I would like to begin um, by introducing the guests we have here today who have agreed to be our on-stage participants in this conversation. And then I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what our aims uh, are for how we're going to conduct this conversation and what my role in that will, uh, will be and what our aspirations are for how this is going to go. So let me invite uh, uh, Steve Belkin up. Steve? Welcome, thanks for being here. Steve is the chairman and founder of Transnational Group Boston, uh, which is a privately held corporation. He's also the principal investor and owner of the Atlanta Hawks and the Atlanta Thrashers. Uh, Steve founded Transnational Group in 1974, pioneering the use of direct mail marketing to pro provide products and services. Uh, Steve is now channeling his efforts towards real estate development in downtown Boston and in farming. Welcome, Steve. Thanks for being here. Uh, Linda Hill, please come on up. She's a, a professor at the Harvard Business School. Um, in organizational behavior. Her consulting and her executive education have been in the areas of managing change and cross-organizational relationships and leadership development. 
Her current two projects are about uh, leading in emerging markets and leadership as collective genius. Thanks for being here, Linda. <laughs> nice to see you. Georgette Mossbacher. Come on up, George Georgette. Welcome. She's the CEO of Borghese Worldwide, an iconoclastic and successful leader of two international cosmetics companies. Uh, she's a nationally recognized political activist, the author of two best-selling books, and she's the founder of the Manhattan Children's Advocacy Center. Thanks for being here. Joe Nye. Where's Joe? Morning, Joe. And Joe is a university distinguished professor and the Sultan of Oman Professor of International Relations at the Kennedy School, uh, was the dean of the Kennedy School for nine years, and his public sector experience has been equally distinguished, uh, serving with several of our national security agencies. Welcome, Joe. Thanks for being here. And Jim O'Toole. Where's Jim? Hi, Jim. How are you? Nice to see you. He's a research professor at the Center for Effective Organizations at the University of Southern California, also a Mortimer J. Adler Senior Fellow of the Aspen Institute. He's an author, uh, and he is currently collaborating with Warren on the current book on judgment. Hi, Jim. Nice to see you. Howard Schultz. Hi, Howard. How are you? He's the chairman of Starbucks Company. Uh, Howard joined Starbucks as a director of operations in 1982 when the company had only four stores. In August of 1987, he purchased Starbucks Company, which now serves customers in over 37 countries. Uh, the long-term goal is to have 30,000 stores worldwide. But apparently his passion is basketball. Uh, he owns the Seattle Supersonics. All right. These are our stage participants who have graciously agreed to be central in this conversation that we're going to be conducting. We also have down here uh, in, in, uh, in amongst us in the audience as well some expert respondents that I'm going to be calling on uh, to talk with us in the course of this conversation. Tal Ben-Shahar, where is Tal? Hi, Tal. Welcome, Tal. Uh, he's an author. He's a lecturer at Harvard University. He uh, teaches uh, the, the, uh, the most subscribed enrolled course at Harvard at the moment in positive psychology, and, uh, and he teaches a course on the psychology of leadership. Uh, most importantly, Tal was a student in Warren Bennis' seminar on leadership, so, and subsequently Warren's teaching assistant. Uh, Ron Heifetz, where's Ron? Hi, Ron. We already uh, heard from Ron this morning. He's co-founder of the Center for Public Leadership and is the King Hussein bin Tal Lecturer in Public Leadership at, uh, at the Kennedy School of Government. Um, he is really a renowned expert on leadership and leadership development, and we're going to be calling upon him for his expertise in that area. Jeff Sonnenfeld is here as well. Welcome, Jeff. Nice to see you. He's the Senior Associate Dean for Executive Programs at Yale School of Management and he's the Lester Crown Professor of Management Practice, as well as the Founder, President, and CEO of the Chief Executive Leadership Institute at Yale School of Management. He's published many books and articles and is interested in Chief Executive Succession and Board Governance. Thanks for being here, Jeff. And Lisa Zigarmi. Hi, Lisa. Lisa. Uh, Lisa is the next generation of upcoming leaders. She currently works with the Ken Blanchard companies, and she's the daughter of Drea and Pat Zigarmi, who are also here. So welcome. Welcome to all of you, and thanks for being part of this conversation. So what we're going to be talking about in this first conversation is um, an idea that, of course, was inspired by Warren's work, and this is this idea of crucibles. You know, uh, the origin of the term crucible is that it was the vessel in alchemy that was believed if you, um, if you applied a tremendous amount of heat to the crucible, then you could turn base metals into gold. And the metaphor here is that one of the things that Warren discovered in his work is that leaders, including very young leaders, those who are effective, really seem to have in common events in their lives that were transformative in some way. They're traumatic, they're painful, they're, they're uh, crisis-oriented, they are in some ways, that's the heat in the crucible, that there's something about these experiences that were, were enormously challenging, threatening, traumatic for the individual, and out of that came some core lessons that really shape the way the individual leads. That's the theme that we're going to be discussing here today, crucibles of leadership. Um, what kinds of experiences really are transformative for leaders? Why is it that some people are able to learn from them and others are not? Um, what are um, the kinds of lessons that people learn and under what conditions are they, are they able to learn them? What we're going to be doing in the course of this conversation uh, and, and how I see my role in the day is I'm going to invite the stage participants uh, to tell some of their stories and to give some of their I ideas about these transformative experiences. But they're not going to be giving formal presentations. This is not an ordinary conference. We're going to hear from some of the stage participants. And then I'm going to go to you, 
because you're part of this conversation as well. And um, the the norms of the day are. By the way, take the tie off, please. This is a thank you. This is a this is a casual conversation. Um, one of the uh, one of the many things uh, that is really wonderful about Warren is that. Um, for those of us who know him know that every time you're in a room with Warren and a conversation takes place, serious learning happens, right? That's, that's a sort of given whenever Warren is in the room. But it's also the case that no matter how serious the subject, including leadership and crucibles and leadership development, it's also a great deal of fun. And so it's in that spirit that we want to conduct this conversation with the whole room here together. So the norms are as follows. You want to get in on the conversation from the very back of the room, wave at me. If I'm facing in this direction and you see that somebody over there wants my attention, um, please say, yo, Ruth, take a look behind your back. Um, my job here is to keep the conversation organized, to keep the themes in the air that are coming out of our conversation, to make sure that we do a good job treating them well, to make sure that everybody who wants in on the, on the conversation is able to do that. I will periodically invite, um, I've, I've talked to all of the panelists, I know some of the things that they have to talk with us about, I will periodically invite them back into the conversation and our, our expert respondents as well. But the, but the norms are, everybody in this room is fair game as part of the conversation. If you are sitting next to somebody that you think has real insight into the, the subject that's, that's on the table at the moment, by all means ask them a question and, and call them into the conversation as well. That's the, the nature of the process that we're going to go through, relaxed, join the conversation. We're going to try and get the whole room involved. I'm going to be moving around a lot. You will know, notice that there are actually, there are microphones all over the place. So if you have a, um, a question or a comment or a remark that you want to make, um, and I've called on you, somebody very nearby you will make sure that you've got a, a microphone. All I ask is that if you have not yet been introduced to the room, this is your first time joining the conversation, please tell us who you are. So introduce yourself before we, we proceed. Okay? Okay, great. So let us begin our conversation about, about crucibles in leadership. And let's begin that conversation by taking a look at, at uh, uh, some video. This is from the interview that David and Betsy did with uh, Warren in Southern California on the subject of crucibles. I think one of the big things about leadership is realizing something about your, your, your capacities, your agency, your, who you are, and that you're not at the effect of life. You are really the author of your own life. No one else is going to do it for you. The crucible has a, um, a religious meaning to it, but it basically means a test, an event, where there's a verdict. <laughs> when you ask people, oh, how do they get here from there? They usually talk about an event. Uh, and this is true of biography as well. Um, uh, Dave, David Gergen uh, has written a little bit about the crucible of Harry S. Truman, uh, whose crucible was falling off his horse, leading a company, a cavalry company in World War I, and how that changed his life. Because up until then, he never thought of himself as a leader, as strong or physical, or that he would enjoy leading. And if John Gardner could be with us, I remember him saying, he said, I don't know. He said, there were some qualities there waiting, to, waiting, for, waiting for life to pull out of me. A haunting phrase. Now, that's what leadership development is all about. If we, can, if we are able to understand that process by which people come out of a series of seminal experiences or crucibles, and from that learn and reflect and come out of it bigger, richer, and more capable as leaders, so it's interesting for leaders who can always see the, the, um, the silver lining. Right. And, and I wonder, too, sometimes where, where um, that comes from. Some of the recent research indicates that about 25% could be in our genetic constraints. But if you read the work of positive psychologists today, I think so much of it is learned. And a few things I would say that are terribly important here is one that uh, health psychologists have talked about for a long time. They call it hardiness. H-A-R-D-I, but it could be heartiness too. It has to do with resilience, with the capacity. And I think every great leader, every great leader without exception has that resilience. All of them seem to have that positive outlook. Every one of them, with nothing to fear but fear itself. Uh, we shall overcome someday. Notice the future part of it. The one thing about holding power is it shows it, like it or not, it, it, it 
reflects the very essence of who we are. Thanks, Warren. So I'm going to begin by asking a couple of our, our stage participants to uh, join us, give us some stimulus material, tell us some of their stories as the beginning point for this conversation. I, I recall, Georgette, I'm going to ask you to start, that resilience or hardiness was a big theme in what you have talked about as your, in your development as a leader. Would you be willing to tell us a little bit about your childhood experiences that you think contribute a lot to you becoming well, I, resilient? I, I don't know that I, you know, at the time that I understood any of this, but uh, um, my mother was um, uh, widowed at uh, 27, and uh, there were four of us. I was the oldest of the four. I grew up in Indiana, northern Indiana, born and raised. Uh, my roots are, I'm a Hoosier. And um, I just came home from school one day, and uh, um, uh, my father had been killed in an automobile accident. And, and there we were. Um, I think uh, being the oldest of four, uh, I don't know that there was any one moment that I can honestly say that I realized um, that my life uh, changed as I knew it up to that point. Um, my mother had to go to work, and uh, we moved in with my grandmother, my mother's mother, who raised her two children uh, on her own, and my great-grandmother, who raised her five children as her husband was killed. And so I did have these three very strong women who stepped up to the role that they um, were thrust on them in having to, to raise their families. And um, I can only remember, it's funny the things you remember, <laughs> but that I said, I know someday I'm, you know, I'm going to make enough money I never have to cook again. <laughs> um, I mean, having to make these meals for my sisters and my brothers, my mother going to work, and, and my grandmother worked, and um, so all of a sudden, um, I mean, I, I can think of those things. They're so simplistic um, now that I, I look back on them and say, you know, I, I swore one day I wouldn't have to do this. I'm not going to make another bed. Um, and I don't know if, um, if, if in somehow that moves you to that position of, of uh, taking, taking control of your life and, uh, and um, having dreams um, that, um, that propelled me to uh, go beyond my circumstances and uh, working my way through college. But I did have, um, I did have three strong role models in, in my mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother um, who, were, who were women that... Um, they never verbalized uh, the fact that um, they had these responsibilities. Um, on the contrary, actually, um, it was, um, that's what you did. Uh, you, you stepped up to uh, your responsibility, and you never looked at it as a hardship. I never thought of it as, um, except when I had to cook. Um, <laughs> I never thought of it as a hardship. Uh, even working my way through college, I mean, t uh, often I uh, questions about, uh, I, I worked three jobs to get myself through Indiana University, and people ask me, well, gosh, that was tough. Well, I didn't, think, I didn't know it was tough, because I didn't have any other options. Um, and uh, I grew up in this environment in which you went out and you took charge, and you did what you had to do, in order to succeed in whatever that, uh, whatever that was. Thank you, Georgette. I wanted also to invite Howard to join the conversation at this point. I understand it's a, a slightly different theme, but that you too have something relatively early in your history, your life growing up in the project in Brooklyn that have shaped how you lead now. Would you be willing to talk to us so about mine that? Mine is a, another childhood story. Uh, I grew up uh, in federally subsidized housing, the projects in Brooklyn, New York. Uh, my dad never made more than $20,000 a year, and at the age of seven, uh, I came home one day and my father was uh, sprawled on a couch with a cast from his hip to his ankle. And uh, uh, what had happened was that he was, he had a series of terrible blue-collar jobs, 
You know, this one was probably one of the worst. He, he was a delivery driver picking up and delivering cloth diapers before the invention of Pampers. And uh, he fell on a sheet of ice and uh, he was out of work. Well, in 1960, if you were a blue collar worker, uneducated, uh, and you got injured on a job, you lost a job, there was no health insurance, no workman's compensation. And my family uh, was just facing the fracturing of what I would loosely characterize as the American dream. Uh, I certainly did not realize at the time this was going to be a crucible. Uh, we just were looking for a way out. And I think what I experienced as a young child, which was an imprinting experience, was the hopelessness and, and the despair of uh, maybe the divide between the haves and the have-nots. Uh, I never realized at the age of seven, and maybe even uh, 10, 15 years later, that I would ever be in a position to be responsible for leading a group of people. But I, I did carry that scar and perhaps that burden for many, many years about recognizing what it's like to be part of a family that uh, faced <coughs> unbelievable hardship when I was a young child. That event is linked directly in many, many ways to the culture and values of Starbucks. Uh, Starbucks became the first company in America to provide health insurance to uh, all of its employees, including, including the 65% that are part-time. That was a transformative event in the equity of the Starbucks brand because it, it created unbelievable trust with our people in recognizing that we wanted to build the kind of company that linked shareholder value to value for our people. And at the same time, we created a, another unique event, which was equity in the form of stock options for every single part-time person. So we did that in 1988 and 89. Before we were public, we had uh, 11 stores and 100 employees at the time. There are now 11,000 stores and 140,000 employees. But the growth of the company aside, I, I can honestly tell you that the linkage to the success of the company is directly linked to the culture and values and the trust that we try to create with our people, which uh, all of which is, is, is directly related to the event that I had as a young boy trying to create the company in a way that my father never got a chance to work for. Thank you. I would like to invite you guys to join in the conversation at this point if you have questions or observations or thoughts that you would like to add before we go back to other participants for their stories. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question of our... Please. Both of you chose childhood experiences. What were the crucible experiences beyond that? Were there other major turning points that caused you to say, I can choose hope versus despair, or um, sort of a positive attitude versus a disappointing or disappointed attitude? Patricia, will you introduce yourself, please? I'm Pat Sigarmi. Thank you. <laughs> Certainly, uh, divorce, I mean, particularly uh, for a woman. I mean, it was, so, uh, I mean, I had to reinvent myself after that. It was, um, it was a totally um, uh, I w it was a paralyzing experience. It was just like you know, the life that you knew goes up in the smoke, and you have to somehow figure out how you rebuild that. Um, you know what they say, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Um, either that or you become paralyzed and you don't move forward. Uh, I think we've had a series of events along the way that have been quite challenging for the company and for me personally. I think whenever you try and do something in which you're going down a road that uh, others have not gone down or are going to be critical of because it's such a different way of trying to build something. There's a lot of self-doubt and vulnerability. Uh, I think one of the things I've talked to Warren about over the years is um, when you're building a company and you are the entrepreneur, there's very few people to talk to because you don't want to demonstrate vulnerability or insecurity. It's not a good trait of a leader, supposedly. Uh, I think the conversations I've had with Warren over the years 
has led me to believe that that actually is a strength. And it's a characteristic that people would embrace. And I think your question for me is learning that it's okay to demonstrate those kinds of emotions and sensitivities and not always to take all of that upon yourself and demonstrate the fact that you're not impervious to feelings. And, and so it's not one thing, it's a series of things of, of uh, learning about yourself and about the task and, and leading people in a way that is human. Please. Hi. Hello. Hi. My name is Gog Boonswang. I was a student in Professor Venice's class when I was an MBA student here at Harvard. Um, my thought or question is, my father was an immigrant from Thailand, and uh, he basically came from a place where he took a shower and made soup out of the same river, and then came here and became a successful physician and I see in a lot of him a lot of traits of, of being a successful leader and what have you. But my question is, you know, he was able to provide a certain life for us in the next generation where we went to boarding school and these Ivy League schools and I see a lot of colleagues and friends that I have that don't have those experiences. They grow up <clears throat> a lot more privileged. And my question to you is, for that next generation, for yourself, when they do have a certain amount of privilege, how do you manufacture the experience that you had? Or how do you create that so that there is a certain fabric that what I think might not be able to be taught if you don't live it? That's it. That is a fantastic question. Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, I think it's a question that many of us struggle with at home at night, talking to my wife or, or for those in the audience, your, your own spouse, about how do you raise children in a life of privilege, uh, or at a minimum, a different life than the one you've had. And um, you know, I think the answer for me personally has been just trying to recreate for them. Not, I mean, I, I remember my father saying to me when I was a kid, and you don't want to say that. Uh, I, don't, I think they, they're not listening. My son at 20 and my daughter at 16 does not want to hear me say when I was a kid, that movie cost a dollar. <laughs> you know, and my daughter just asked me for 50. You know, I was just, anyway. Uh, uh, um, I, I think what we've tried to do is get underneath it all and talk about the values of our family and the values of living a balanced life and, and trying to do everything we can to involve them in things that I know it sounds trite or strange but community service and giving back and we've tried to imprint that very early on and um, I think the basic tenets of life not uh, never trying to in any way create the impression that because we have uh, privilege or money or resources that we're better than anyone else and in fact we're not uh, but I, I think your, the, your question is, a, is probably the most important question of parenting uh, when you're growing up in a family that you didn't have anything and then you have a lot and your kids are growing up in privilege. And I, I don't think there's a silver bullet answer to this. This is an everyday uh, level of commitment and understanding and a deep sensitivity to watching how your kids are growing up and correcting behavior when you see something that is not right. I think you have to lead by example. I mean, I, I, I don't think it's, it's something you can, you can put a plan together. Uh, I think it happens every day, every minute, uh, and it's the values that you have, the way you conduct yourself. Um, and I think that's true whether it's in your family or, or your business, um, that that culture that you create is um, that what you, who you are and what you believe. Uh, I'd like to add one comment that I think everybody growing up, even our children of the more affluent um, people, they have their own crucibles. They have their own events. They, they might be different than ours, but in their lives, they're just as traumatic or just as challenging. And m my experience that I learned a lot of this wisdom from my partnership with my wife ha has been to let them solve their own problems, to empower them as a parent, and I think a lot of affluent parents go and try to save their kids. They try to solve their kids' problems. 
because most people who become affluent are good problem solvers because that, that's how you become successful, solve all the problems you're faced in life. So, you know, my answer would be that children of affluent people do have the, their own experiences and you just have to empower them and tell them you have confidence that they can solve this problem. And to get that that is as big of a problem for them as it, your problem might have been for you that you thought was so much bigger to you when you were growing up, but, but it's just as big to them and to, to not belittle their problem or, or their challenge. Joe, did you want to add something? Yeah, I, I think that that's an important point. Affluence isn't always that easy. Uh, it's nice to have a rags to riches Lincoln-esque story, but uh, let me give you a brief biographical example. I had a rather privileged background. I went to Princeton as an undergraduate. In my sophomore year, I was rejected by the eating club I wanted to join. That's a tremendous blow to an adolescent ego. <laughs> what did I do? I then went to as far away as I could that summer and worked in an exploratory mining camp on the border between British Columbia and Alaska, below one glacier and above another. And I had to prove myself to 100 men none of whom had college education. All the things that I'd had in affluence, whether you'd been to a prep school, whether you'd gotten into this club or that club, totally irrelevant. And it was the act of working in a way with these men and proving myself to them that let me go back. And then I hitchhiked back across the country to Princeton. When I went back, I had a very different attitude on who I was. That's an example, I think, of Warren's Crucible. But it was, it, for an adolescent who was from an affluent background, you could have either adapted to that by proving yourself in a different circumstance and developing an identity of your own, or you could have accepted the identity that was given to you by the social system that had categorized you. So affluence ain't that easy. <laughs> Thank you, Joe. One second. I have to please stand and introduce yourself. Thank you. Uh, yes, Ken Blanchard. Uh, I think as we talk about the crucibles of, of privileged kids, my, our son Scott has now become a speaker, and it's interesting when he starts a lot of his speeches, he says, how would you like to be the one-minute son? <laughs> and uh, and, and he, uh, he said, when I was a kid and I would do something wrong, he said, I used to just dream that I would be punished like the other kids, you know, sent to your room or even spanked, but I had to go to dinner and talk about how my behavior was inconsistent with family values. <laughs> and, uh, so I have a feeling that the crucible these kids have is us, uh, uh, maybe, and how do they live with, with uh, parents like this. And I have a friend right here next to me. I think we ought to ask some comments, because Steve, talk about a family, he only has 45 grandchildren. Sandra's over at the 45th uh, birth uh, and isn't here. But Steve, how, do, how does your family deal uh, with it? Because you have a family. <laughs> Well, it's a day-to-day -day experience, I'll tell you. And the thing we've learned is, the thing we've learned is the best thing for us to do is to affirm our own kids. Because they're in the middle of the crucibles every day, and some of them have six, seven, eight kids, and they're fighting it all every day. So we just say, you're doing marvelously. We believe in you. You know, <laughs> just good luck and good night. <laughs> Ruth, Ruth please I, I, yeah. uh, if I can make a comment, and particularly it's, uh, to you, I, I am at the business school, and one of the things that at, at Harvard, and one of the things we thought a lot about was the research that Sharon Parks did on a group of MBAs at a leading business school in the East Coast. What Sharon Parks, and I highly recommend her research to you, she did a study of our MBAs and discovered that they were not as developed in terms of their moral development as they should be and wanted to understand why that was the case. And the reason it was the case, according to her research, which I think is very powerful, is that they had been in the flow of success. The only way you could get accepted at the Harvard Business School was if you had been successful all along the way. And consequently, they had not had very many crucibles and did not know themselves very well. And we, as a faculty, spent a lot of time thinking about what the implications of that were for how we thought about uh, develop, creating our leadership course. And I remember when I was asked to actually work on a power and influence course, I wrote a little, I wrote, I summarized Sharon's research and gave it to the MBAs, but they weren't very happy to hear that they yeah, were right. underdeveloped on any dimension. 
or that they but, needed more pain. Or that right, and yeah. yes. So I recall, you know, they came to see me privately about it a bit. This is you try you test out things in the second year before you subject the entire first year class to it. But it was interesting the conversations I had with them, and what Sharon Parks's research showed was the only MBAs who weren't, if you will, underdeveloped on more. This is a, a really a, a summarizing research in some ways, not too fairly were ones who had had personal experience. Father had been fired, uh, the kind of experiences you all talked about, or actually had moved to a different country and had to learn to work in a very different context. And so those students, and I guess those were crucibles, actually knew themselves. And the reason why their moral development wasn't where it should be is they had not had adversity enough that it would force them to stop and look at themselves and figure out what they actually valued. It wasn't they didn't have values, they just didn't know because they had not been forced to introspect. And what we do know, which is kind of, I mean, Warren is an exception in some ways, people don't tend to introspect about success because there is much learning to be had from actually introspecting on your success, but we are kind of practical learners when we get to be adults and we only think about adversity. So that research I, has very much shaped my thinking about what I'm up to in trying to develop leaders, at least the Harvard Business School. And everyone does have their crucibles, and it also helped me explain why the first year of the MBA program was so traumatic for people, because it was the first time many felt they may not succeed, going back to the affluent piece of it. And they, you know, like they're traumatized by something that to me feels like a relatively safe environment, under the, given the environments you could be in. So that ends up being a crucible that we actually try to utilize to push your learning forward about yourself because you need to understand what you value. You do have values, they're very deep, you just don't know what they are. And once those become articulated, you're much more likely to be able to live and execute relative to those, those values. So this is one of the themes I was hoping to explore a little bit today, which is how, how necessary is it that, be, that it be painful and traumatic in order for it to be a true crucible and a, and a learning experience um, is it possible to have a positive experience that serves, not necessarily a su success, but some sort of positive experience in your history that serves as a crucible? Now, Steve, well, actually, your story I thought actually was pretty traumatic sounding. I'm not sure Joe's was, but go ahead, Jim. No, actually, I had a crucible experience yeah. myself this morning. Um, <laughs> <laughs> for the first time in five years, I went looking for a Starbucks and I couldn't find one. <laughs> I am now stuck with how am I going to jumpstart my brain to be able to answer these questions. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm slightly worried about the, the, the way the conversation is going, okay. um, in that I think as my Hungarian grandfather used to say, uh, we're putting the accent on the wrong syllable. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, Warren does talk about the crucible experience, but he also immediately talks about learning and he talks about reflection on experience. And it strikes me that the important thing in creating a leader is not the experience, but really how we are able to process it and make sense of it and then make use of it to become a more effective leader. When we think about the great leaders, and we think about someone like uh, Mohandas Gandhi, we think about his very famous crucible experience when he was around 40 years old and he was uh, thrown off the train traveling from, uh, from, from Durban to Pretoria. And after that, he really changed his life, and, and he became dedicated to um, uh, addressing the evils of, of colonialism. But it, in fact, it really wasn't that event. Uh, that event uh, was very important in his life. But if we look at what happened over the next 40 years of his life, every single day, almost every single event that occurred during his life, uh, uh, trivial events uh, in, in leading the ashram, he would come back and he would think about the experience, what he learned from the experience, when he would try something with, with people to, to help them uh, change their behavior in a way that would be more effective for the people in the ashram, and it didn't work. He would go back and he would spend hours thinking about what did, he said, what did I do wrong? How could I be a more, effective, a more effective leader? And I think it's really that process of the continual learning throughout one's life, uh, the continual processing, that we really ought to be focused on uh, more than the events themselves, because a lot of people have had the same kinds of events as Howard and the others, but they didn't benefit from them. Mm -hmm. right? And so the question is, what is it about, uh, uh, about Howard and the others that made him able to create this great institution from, from this experience. How is, and so I think it's really that, that, that process of learning that's really important. Mm -hmm. Not the nature of the, the event, but the, so. the individual and some yeah. process of learning. That, please, yes, thank you. <coughs> you would stand. Uh, I'm Joan Goldsmith. Hi. 
Uh, I'm concerned, uh, I, I love where you're going with this conversation. I'm concerned a bit about what I think of as faux crucibles. <laughs> because the people who package our current president are masters at uh, talking about his life uh, and his uh, crucibles and how he wrote. And he uses this idea to try to rally us into uh, a very destructive war. And I'm concerned about how do we help the people that we're teaching learn to deal with toxic leaders, to use uh, Jean Lippmann Blumen's phrase, I don't know where Jean is, but she's here, and she has a wonderful book on that. And how do we discern uh, true crucibles and learn from them uh, and use them positively? And how do we say, wait a minute, you know, this isn't really a crisis or a crucible here? That's a great question. Jim, did you want to respond to that? that well, <clears throat> you know, to um, take things down a notch from Gandhi, pretty high, <laughs> a high standard. Um, we, we have to go to, um, to Corning, New York, the Corning Glassworks, when we see uh, about 15, 20 years ago when Jamie Houghton uh, became the CEO of, of Corning. And he, he got the job the old-fashioned way. Uh, he inherited it. And, um, and, and as, as we might well imagine, he wasn't very effective because uh, he believed that, that what leaders do is take charge and tell everybody what to do. And uh, the company was in trouble when he took it over, and it got worse under his leadership over the next few years. And he uh, describes a moment when he found out that somebody had made a mistake, had spent some money on a program that was uh, uh, clearly a, 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 an incredible waste of resources. And he heard the story, and he pointed his finger and said, who did it? And all of a sudden, the people who were uh, in the top management team, they called themselves the Six Pack, um, were silent, and they stared at him. And he says, I, I understood then, you know, at that moment, that it's not all about me, uh, that I can't do all this myself. Uh, that I was being uh, very directive, I was being tyrannical, believing that, that that's the way one, you know, one, one leads. And he's talked about how that event um, changed uh, uh, the way he led, and, and then he became very effective letting other people lead and allowing other people to lead after that. But what is interesting about the e event is that you would think that, that actually, in fact, he learned at that moment from, from the event, but he really didn't learn from the event. It was through the interactions with the six-pack, through learning to trust them and using them uh, as mirrors of himself, uh, getting them to, be, to give him honest feedback, and then trusting a coach, a person who was uh, getting ready to retire, uh, a, a senior person who he, he kept around and, and he asked him to keep telling him the truth about himself. And it was really through a process of learning that it, that it occurred. It really wasn't the, the, the event. Perhaps that one event you know, made, it, made all the rest of it possible. But it was the opening up to, to, a, to a, a continual process with help from his friends, because most of us are not like Gandhi. Gandhi is, was capable, one of the few people in the whole world was able to, of actually looking at himself and drawing the lessons all by himself. The rest of us need a little help from our friends, or from psychiatrists, or from, or, or from others, or from a team. And, and, and so I think that we have to, when we talk about these events, we really have to talk about it in, in, a, in a much broader context to truly understand it. Great. Please, one, and then two, in the back there. Please. Uh, my name is. Yes, you're okay. It's on. Yes. Uh, my name is Uri Hersher, and you're very fortunate that I have laryngitis. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been sitting here listening to various uh, references to the word crucible, and I must admit that uh, as I hear them, at times I cringe. Um, <coughs> because the word means something else to me and therefore